as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets. It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another Quarantine TV edition of Real Fans Real Talk in collaboration with the Sanchez Show. We got some things going on in sports this week. NBA playoffs are right around the corner. Had a big, big boxing match this weekend. And uh, baseball is, is, is heating up all around the board. But uh, before we get into that, let me introduce my co-host, Legend of Two Games, Eric Sanchez. What's going on, man? What's really good, bro. And uh, happy Mother's Day out there to all the beautiful moms. Your mom at my mom as well. Um, yes. Hope you guys enjoyed your day yesterday as well. Absolutely, absolutely. With that being said, you know what? We was going to actually start off with uh, with the NBA today, but I just got the news a little while ago about uh, Jacob DeGrom. So we're going to switch things up. We're going to talk about Jacob DeGrom, his injury. He's headed to the injured list right now. Um, the Mets actually just came off of winning five straight games. I know this is your team, Eric. So talk to me about, about uh, Jacob DeGrom and how the Mets will do uh, during the stretch where he'll be out. Well, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate. He had gotten off to a very strong start to the season. Uh, I believe he was still leading the league in, in uh, ERA through his first seven starts. Um, he had a stretch where he had 50 strikeouts over four starts. So he was, he was performing very well. And uh, this injury has actually been lingering since his last start. Yesterday's performance, he was looking very solid. He had gone five innings, had only given up one run before they had to take him out the game. But um, I think we can tread water and continue to play well. The offense is starting to pick up a little bit. Finally, Lindor starting to hit. Alonzo starting to hit. Conforto's getting warm as well. But uh, the rest of the starting pitches have been very good. Marcus Stroman, who takes them out tomorrow against the Orioles, has been very strong to start the season. Uh, Tawan Walker has been very good. And we're expecting to get Syndergaard back in about a month. So I think we can be all right while he's gone. But it's going to put a lot more pressure on the offense to pick it up, especially on those times around the rotation when he would have been pitching again. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's crazy because, I mean, you know what, Eric. Jacob DeGround, his best pitcher in the game. I mean, at least, you know, I think so. I know you think so, um, but I just think he, he is all around. He, he he made it to a strong six, and then in the sixth inning, it just, you know, he, was, he wasn't feeling it. I, hopefully for you guys, he's not going to be out for too long. Um, but the good thing is, again, you guys won five straight um, just now. Jacob DeGrom only pitched in one of those five games, so which means that the team is, is doing pretty good right now. Um, yeah, I know it's going to affect the uh, somewhat because – Obviously, you know, we we're talking about the best pitcher in baseball. He'll definitely be missed. But I think that the, the Mets will still be able to push this thing along for as long as they have to until Jacob DeGrom returns. Yeah, and as you said, the, the winning streak has been a combination of the good pitching with the offense finally starting to come around um, because we lost so many close games in the first two weeks of the season. Now the offense is starting to heat up a little bit. But we need Marcus Stroman to continue to pitch strong. You know, he's our second best pitcher right now. We need him to stay strong. We need uh, Tawan Walker to keep pitching very well. He's been a great addition through free agency. And hopefully the ground comes back and, and picks up right where he was at. But more importantly, again, the offense. If the offense starts to click and the offense can carry us a little bit, I think we'll be okay. Yeah, I, I told you a couple of weeks ago, um, the, the beginning of the season, they had a, there was an article and it said the five teams um, that could basically could dethrone the Dodgers and both the Yankees and the Mets uh, were, were on that, on that list of teams. So I think, yeah, when he comes back, they can, they should be able to get back to, uh, to where things were. 
Um, I'm happy the Yankees are finally starting to heat up. They they turning things around completely from they had maybe the roughest start this season of, of any team. Um, but guys are getting it together. They are, are, are heating up at the right time. Um, so you know we had uh, won a good series against the Astros. The Yankees are looking are looking pretty good right now, and I'm just hoping this thing carries on. Even German looked good the other night. And he, you know, I think for him is more so mental than, than anything right now, getting back to where he was. Yeah, I, you guys definitely have turned it around. A very uh, tough start to the season. I think you guys were like 5-15. and 15, um, And then you got going. And kudos, you know, to, to the team as a whole. Uh, the other day, you guys went up against Max Scherzer, and Scherzer was, was lights out in that game. You know, he held you out of one run pretty much through eight innings. And then you guys found a way to tie the game up late and then win it in the next innings. You guys beat him again yesterday on a walk-off, beat the Nationals, that is. So you guys are finding ways to win, um, similar to the Mets in terms of the, the lineup starting to warm up just a little bit. You know, it seems as the temperature starting to go up, the bats are starting to warm up as well. Um, so, you know, for you guys, and like you said, you need Herman to step it up because, you know, we talk about the Grom, Cole might be the second best pitcher in all of baseball. And he has yeah. been phenomenal for you guys. And now you just need to find that secondary guy who can compliment him. And if, if Herman is that guy, I think you then you guys, we're going to start to see the real potential of the Yankees. Exactly, exactly. Um, really quick, before we get off of uh, baseball, uh, the machine, we've only known him to play for two teams, uh, the Cardinals and, the, and of course, the Angels, where he you know, had his most recent run. Um, because the contract is up, which I, okay, so I was a little bit confused by that because I didn't know you could, your contract could run out in the middle of the season like that. So, Eric, what, what, what went down with Albert Pujols and, and, and the Angels and how, like, why is it such a big, weird thing right now? Yeah, so they were, they basically negotiated a buyout. Um, from what I've read and what I've heard, it got ugly behind the scenes with him and manager Joe Madden. He wasn't happy about the way he was being used. And so they kind of negotiated. He was in the last year of the deal anyway, so they kind of negotiated the buyout just to get him out of there. He says he has no intentions of retiring. Um, it's a Hall of Fame career, first and foremost. Like, we, we need to highlight that. He's going in first ballot. Um, but at 41 years old, I don't know if there's a third team on the docket for him. As you yeah. said, it, we've only known him to play for two teams. Up to this point, again, 41 years old, he's 33 home runs away from 700, which is a historic number in the game of baseball. But if you take a deeper dive into the numbers, this guy was a 10-time All-Star, three-time MVP, two-time champion, two-time Silver Slugger, two-time winner of the Hank Aaron Award, a uh, great family man. Um, he's always presented himself in, you know, with the utmost respect. Uh, he's done a lot for the Christian community as well as the Down Syndrome community. Him and his wife are big advocates for the Down Syndrome Association because their oldest child was born with Down Syndrome. So he's been a great ambassador for the game of baseball, a great man for the sport. Um, we always talk about guys who present themselves in the right way. And we've never heard anything bad about Albert Pujols, you know, yeah. throughout his career. And unfortunately, the injuries in Anaheim just started catching up to him. You know, I, I, I was thinking about it the other day when he got released and his St. Louis years were so dominant, man. You know, the, mm -hmm. the years he was there, when we talk about the accolades, nine of those all-star appearances were in St. Louis. You know, all three of those MVPs, those two World Series were all there in St. Louis. By his yeah. second year in Anaheim, his body started betraying him a little bit, and it was before Mike Trout got there. So just imagine if we could have gotten to see a prime pool host with Mike Trout, mm -hmm. because when pool host went there, he was the best player in all of baseball. Yeah. Um, but his body betrayed him a little bit, and, and now he's at a point, you know, late in his career where he's looking to latch on. He may still have a little bit more. Um, last year's numbers, I'm not going to go by that because that was a 60-game season, and we know everybody's numbers were off. But the year before, he had 23 home runs and 85 RBIs. So he yeah. seems like a guy who could still be productive. I just don't know if somebody at 41 years old is going to give him a shot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like you said, again, first battle hall of fame, I think. And I think he was that before he even left the, the Cardinals. Um, you know what I mean? So I think it was just like the extra years adding on patent stats to, to the end the angels years. Um, 33 home runs away from 700. I would love to see him get there. Um, he wants to start. I know that, um, at first base, but I think that he should, uh, there, there's a, there's a position in the, in the American league called the designated hitter. I think he should find a playoff team 
in you know in the in the American League that will have him and just go in and DH and just work on them stats, work on getting to 700s because that's going to be big for his career, his 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 legend, but also for his brand. Once he gets to 700 home runs, that puts him on a list with I believe what was it, three or four other people that that have uh, three. How many was three, three? Three other, other people. Guys. That's it. Mm-hmm. And one of them, you know, even though I give him the, the the credit and I don't take it away from him, you know, a lot of people like to put an asterisk next to Barry's name. Um, so you know, that puts you in a different ballpark, different kind of, uh, of club. So I think that he should just look at a, a team in the American League um, that he could DH on and just work on knocking him out the park. He's going to hit him. He, he's still got the strength to, to hit home runs out the park. So even if you if you latch on for another year and a half and it takes you another year and a half, you could do it as just playing the DH. You're not playing, you know what I mean? It's only you got, you got to play defense every week. And if you have to, maybe you can hit the mound, hit first base for a quick second, you know, every once in a while. But just get on a team that you can go to and just knock balls out of the park and get to 700. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure where the fit would be, but I agree with you. He he needs to just be a DH and hopefully land with a team that has a playoff caliber potential where he can be an impact player. Um, but worst case scenario, you know, he may still be able to land on a young team like Kansas City or like Toronto who may just want to bat in a lineup and somebody who can be a guiding influence. Mike Trout the other day spoke very highly of Albert Pujols and said Albert was his man. You know, Albert pretty much mentored him all these years in Anaheim and spoke of how great a clubhouse guy he is. So if he can't land on with a contender, maybe he lands on as a mentor somewhere. And I think if he is able to at least get enough at bats, he might be able to crack 700 within the next two years. Yeah. So I, that's what I say. Either if, if not, if you're not going to come to the American league, um, the only other thing I would say is like, if you did want to stay in the national league is go back to the, the Cardinals, if they'll have you, and try to get 700 there. You know what I'm saying? Take you he, at this point you got enough money. So even if it means you got to take take less just to be there for 2 years so that you could do it in, you know, w- with the Cardinals organizations, then you know what? Just go ahead and do it. Just get to 700, man, by any means necessary. Nobody's going to take anything away from you because you're one of the greatest players to ever play this game. You're already a first ballot Hall of Famer. Um so, you know, guys stick around to chase rings all the time. You just say, you know, you want to get to 700, you know? So just go ahead and uh, and do that. Because those numbers, you know, we had a we had a whole movie starring Bernie Mac based on being in the 3000 hit club. You know what I mean? So those numbers mean something as far as your brand goes. And when you're talking about long life after your career is over in Major League Baseball. So I would love to see it. Shout out to Albert Pujols. Um, you know, like I said, one of the greatest to ever play the game of baseball. And I've enjoyed watching him throughout his career. I'm going to enjoy the rest of his career. And I hope he does make it to uh, to, to 700 home runs. Um, but Absolutely. let's jump over. I agree with you on that, bro. Let's get, over, let's get into this uh, NBA race right now, playing tournament. There's a lot going down. LeBron is still out. You know, I, Skip Bay is going to say he just rested. That's why he's staying out right now. Um, but, oh, man, it's, it's heating up right now. The, the, the Blazers are looking really good right now. Washington is looking really good on in in you know in the Eastern Conference, even though Bradley Beal just went down. Um, but I am loving this 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 playing tournament right now and what it's going to look like. Um, who do you who do you think will come out of the play, uh, out of the, the playing tournament in in the Eastern and the West? So, and this is why I love the the playing tournament because, as you just said, it's heating up, and now we're in the last week of the season, and it means something, right? Teams just can't sit back. Um, playing tournament, I'm gonna go in the Western Conference based on where the standings are today. It, it's Monday, May 10th. Lakers right now are a game back in seventh, so we're gonna assume that they would be in a playing tournament. I think Lakers would be in the playing tournament, would win their game in the playing tournament. And I think Golden State would be in as the eighth seed. That's where I'm going with the West. Uh, with the East, I hate to show any confidence in this team, but I just think that they have enough talent to win a playing game. Uh, Boston is going to win their playing game. And I think the Wiz, man, the Wiz have been hot. I think Russell Westbrook has really changed the dynamic of that team over the last month and a half. 
Um, I know we were all down on Russ earlier this season when he was struggling and he was dealing with little injuries, I guess, that we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. But they got to get Bradley Beal back. It's already been announced he's going to miss the next two games with the hamstring. So they got to get him back in time. But the dynamic of those two guys, man, the other night I was watching them and Brad goes for 50. You got Russ going for 28, 17, and 14. Like, them dudes are playing off each other so well. And then the craziest stat that I saw, I've, I've seen probably all season, when the Wizards have a, a lead at halftime of a game, they are 28 and four. So they are truly hit or miss. Like, if they have a lead at halftime, it's like they know how to close out the game. But if they yeah. don't have a lead at halftime, it's like they fall apart. <laughs> Anything so, else. <laughs> right. It, it, whatever you want to make of that stat. But the stat just sounded crazy to me because I'm like, it, it really identifies who they are as a team because they got yeah. 31 wins on the season. And pretty much all of those wins have come when they've had a lead at halftime. So they're the team that I have a little bit more confidence in. I like Charlotte a lot, man, but I just don't know if Charlotte's going to have enough to win a one game scenario. So I, that's why I'm picking Boston and, and Wizards over them. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, Boston, it's like, come on, let's not. I would hope anyway that 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 wouldn't even be a situation where we're like guessing if Boston could win a playing game, especially versus those other teams that are that are listed. Because you're talking about Charlotte, Washington, and Indiana. I would hope that Boston, a team that's been in the conference finals the last couple of years, or at least you know two of the last three years. I would hope that they could win a playing game in, in this situation. I think they're the best team out of that four. I think if they would have got to act together a little bit sooner, they wouldn't even be in the playoff, in the playing tournament anyway. I think the, the team is better than their record, um, but they they just struggled a lot. They couldn't get it together. Um, but, yeah, and, and I got to go Washington with other 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 seeds just because they're the, the hottest uh, team right now. They, you know, seven out of their last ten games they won – you know, Russell Westbrook is just on fire. And it's to the point where I just get, like, I get tired of people just, you know, throwing dirt on Westbrook's name. It's like, all right, get, like, enough. Like, but you got to respect what this man is doing right now. And, you know, like, you can't even appreciate what Westbrook is doing because there's so much hate on towards Westbrook. Like, yo, this man is on the triple doubles list, <laughs> like, what he's what he's doing – and we're not even talking about in his whole career, because this is really maybe like the last five or six years of his career where he just turned up and was averaging damn near triple double. So these numbers and the records that he's breaking. So have, go ahead, go ahead, Eric. Go ahead, Eric. No, no, I, I wanted to back up your point there too, because you're right. I, I wanted to back up your point there because the triple double, the, the people are hating on him. He's going to end with the most triple doubles of all time in NBA history. His numbers, his averages over the last five years are 25 points a game, 10 rebounds, 10 assists. He's averaging a triple-double over a five-year span. He's on pace to get his fourth, fourth year of triple-doubles within the last five years. The dude has been phenomenal, and I think sometimes we place too much value on, oh, but they don't got a ring. They don't got a ring. The dude is balling. Yeah. Like, look, I mean, this next triple-double separates him from Oscar Robinson, and he is the all-time leader in triple doubles. That is not easy to do, one. And if you look at the guys that are on the list behind him, there's, and I'm only, I'm not even going to say, I'm going to keep LeBron out because LeBron's only at, he has 99. But at the guys that have 100 plus triple doubles, it's Russell Westbrook, Oscar Robinson, Magic Johnson, and Jason Kidd. These guys are all Hall of Fame players. Russell Westbrook is a Hall of Fame player. Like, but we focusing so much on because he doesn't have a ring, he don't have this and that. It's like we can't even enjoy what he's actually doing right now. This is legendary stuff from what Russell Westbrook. Like, we gotta give him his props. Like, ease up. All right, he don't he don't have the ring, whatever. Like, let's let's be clear. When Russell Westbrook was in OKC, he was not the best player on his team. Uh, supposedly, anyway, for, supposedly Kevin Durant was the best player on that team, right? It was Kevin Durant, and then Russell Westbrook was was second after that. So, and the losses that they took, guess what? Kevin Durant, as the best player on that team, was a large part of those losses because he didn't play well in those games. So, and then you have it where, okay, you want to talk about Kevin Durant leaves, Westbrook is still getting to the playoffs. 
All right, they don't make it out of the first round. But Westbrook is also an MVP there. He's also averaging a triple double for the first time, and I think was was 30, 40 years damn near at the time when he did it, and then is consistently doing it for every team that he goes to, to the point where now he is about to be number one on the all time triple doubles list. We got to put some more respect on Russell Westbrook's name. I'm definitely taking them to to win in this playing tournament. Him and Bradley Beal together. That backcourt, I think, can compete. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't listen with Stefan and Clay. If they if they're playing the way they've been playing, that 28 and four backcourt like that, where Bradley Bill is leading the league in store, scoring, and Russell Westbrook is putting up 20 assists, triple doubles, 20 rebound triple doubles. That is is a really good backcourt combination. They work together. If they had a big man up in there somewhere that was around All Star level they would really make some noise in the Eastern Conference. Yeah, I, I, I actually like their roster, though. I, I like the compliment of big men because you got a little ruggedness with Robin Lopez. You got athleticism with Daniel Gafford. Um, their first-round pick, Danny Avidija, he's out for the season, so he's not contributing. But they still got Roy Huchamora from, uh, what was that, two drafts ago. So That's they got boy. some <laughs> nice complimentary pieces. I, That's your boy. That's you know, your people. I, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't think um, you know, we're not, and again, we're talking about them as a team that's gonna win that playing game, which we both like. But I think again, if their backcourt gets hot, they can put a scare in somebody too. I don't think they got enough to win a series, but I yeah. damn sure don't want to be facing Bradley Bill, who's been averaging over 30 points a game this year, and Russell Westbrook, who's been getting a triple double damn near every night. You know, that that's the last team I want to see because that's not an easy first round opponent. So yeah. you know, we we gotta give Russ a lot of credit, man. And Listen, we got to highlight the haters, too, because there was some of y'all out there when he got that first triple double who made it seem like, oh, he's just chasing stats. Oh, they let him get the rebounds. Oh, they want him to get the triple double. Well, what's the excuse now? Because we five years into this run and he's still getting triple doubles. You, you telling me every every teammate just let him get rebounds? Every, every teammate team. is just helping him pump his stats <laughs> Word, on no. every team. So on every team, they just letting him pump his stats now. Because now the we're dude, talking about the dude three is one of the teams. hardest working players in the game. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he's one of the hardest working players in the game. Period. Night in, night out, you know what you're getting from Russ, man. Yeah, um, and then as far as in, in in the West goes, same thing. If 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 it were to, if it were to start right now, I'm not even sure that the Lakers will wind up being in the playing tournament. Um, just because I'm just looking at the strength of schedule, and I know Portland has been hot, but they also have to play. Uh, Utah, they have to play Denver, and I believe they have to play Phoenix as three of their last four games. And the Lakers have um, the, the the Pelicans, where Zion is out for the season already, and, and Ingram is banged up. Um, I believe they had Chicago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they had the Knicks, and I forget who was the last team, but it's a pretty winnable schedule. Especially if you're going to get 42, 12, three, three steals and three blocks <laughs> out of Anthony Davis. And uh, oh, they got Houston as well. That was the other team. <coughs> Excuse me, Houston. Um, so if you, if you add all those things in, I don't even know if the, the Lakers will be in the play in tournament once it's all said and done. But if, it, if we're just going by right now, if the playoffs was to start right now, I would say the Lakers and, and, and Golden State. Steph has been the hottest in the NBA the second half of the season, putting up some crazy numbers, breaking Kobe records, shooting threes from everywhere, all over the all over the court as he as he's known for doing, as he the reason why he got the name <laughs> that, that he has. So I would say those two teams uh move on. But I can't wait, man. I think this is going to be a very interesting playoffs. Normally I wouldn't do this, Eric, but I'm gonna shout y'all out again this week because I think that was a big win against the Clippers. Uh, on the road the other day. So I'm going to give you all a little bit of props for that win because that was actually a really good win for them. And, and they needed that win too because they want to keep home court advantage in that first round. Yeah, um, we had a very important win. Uh, I thought when we went on this six-game road trip, in all, on, in all honesty, I really thought if we can just go two and four, we would be okay. But we were able to get three wins and now we got to try to get greedy and see if we could beat the Lakers tomorrow, which isn't out of the possibility because we don't know if Braun and AD are both going to play. So we may yeah, be able to get Braun's a banged up Lakers team. Game. 
I think it's not going right. to come back so, until Houston. Right. So we may be able to get greedy and steal that one and then kind of really build a little cushion, man. Um, but in terms of the Lakers, I want to throw you a little curveball because I was thinking about this yesterday as I'm watching the game, right? So you brought up a great point in terms of schedule. Uh, Portland has Houston tonight. The Lakers have the Knicks tomorrow. So these next two days could give us a better idea of what's going on with that six spot because if Portland is able to win, they keep building a little bit of cushion on the Lakers. Then that game against Portland Phoenix late in the season may not mean anything. Phoenix is two games back out of the number one spot right now. And because of, of how late in the schedule that game is, that could be one of those games where Portland kind of rests up their guys in anticipation of the playoff series coming up. But I don't think the Lakers being the seventh seed is that bad of an idea anymore. Because as much as, as I kept thinking about it, right, and I'm hearing everybody talking about, oh, Phoenix, they beat the Lakers twice this year. Yeah, but they didn't really beat the Lakers twice. They beat a Laker team that had no AD the first time, and then they beat the Laker team that had no Braun or AD the second time. So they haven't even really played the Lakers. They played the cast of guys, right? Yeah. Yesterday was the first game AD played against Phoenix. He tortured them. He absolutely abused them. And this is an AD that's still working his way back into shape. So mm -hmm. for me, when I look at the, the possible matchups, if I'm the Lakers, right, before the season started, we thought we expected the Lakers to be a top three team in the West. Obviously, injuries have changed the course of that. But if I'm the Lakers, do I really want to play the Clippers in the first round, knowing that Braun is still working himself back? That might yeah. be one of the toughest first round matchups for us. We might not want them right away. And that's not to say the Lakers can't beat them, but that's probably not the matchup you want first. When so I look at Phoenix, seed. I look, right. That would be getting to the six seed. When I look at Phoenix, I look at a team that's inexperienced that only has two core guys that are really playoff tested. And that's Chris Paul and Jay Crowder. Everybody else in that team, this would be their first playoff series. Phoenix yeah. isn't very deep. I've said it before. I don't really buy into the narrative that Phoenix is a title contender because they really only go about seven deep. They don't have much of a bench. They don't have the supporting cast where you would fear like, man, that guy in a playoff series, do we really know what Devin Booker is going to do in a playoff series? Do we know what DeAndre Ayton is going to do in a playoff series? And yesterday showed us that they have absolutely no answer for, for Anthony Davis. And that was, again, a Laker team that didn't have Braun, that didn't have Dennis Schroeder. I think personally, Lakers being seventh wouldn't be the worst thing in the world because Phoenix is probably the easiest first round matchup they could get. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess when you look at it from that from that point, it might be the easiest first round matchup that they could get. Even though I think that they'd probably beat Utah in the first round series as well, because we don't even know if Donovan Mitchell um, is even going to be ready coming back into that series. Mm -hmm. As well, so I was, you know, outside of that, I think, yeah, which is crazy <laughs> that I'm saying that the one and the two seed is gonna be the easiest <laughs> seed for the for and, the Lakers to, to beat. Right, be because in terms of situation, if Braun isn't gonna have much games to get back in shape for the playoffs, and and physically we know he's in shape, but I mean game shape. Yeah. yeah. If he's not gonna have much of an opportunity to get into game shape, I don't want to play the Clippers right away. You know what yeah, I'm saying? No. Like, I don't want to play – I don't a, a Clipper team that's pretty much been built to try to beat the Lakers, I don't want to play them right away. I probably don't even want to play Denver right away. Like, Denver was competitive against us last year. I don't want to play them right away and, and possibly have to go up against the potential MVP of the league in the first round. I want the yeah. easiest possible scenarios. So, like you said, Utah without Donovan Mitchell, absolutely. He'll be another guy trying to work himself back into game shape. And exactly. here so comes it's Brian. It's got to be pretty much even. And then You'd have both of them – yeah, and then and then Phoenix. Those those are the series I would want if I'm the Lakers. Yeah, especially like looking at what just went down <laughs> with Phoenix last last night and the way Anthony Davis just completely abused them. Um, you know, even though you know, even Andre Drummond was in foul trouble a lot, but he was getting a lot of offensive rebounds, which is important, especially in the playoffs, because you you're gonna need second chance opportunities. That's how. LeBron in Miami beat the, the, the Spurs that year because they had a second chance because of that tip out to Ray Allen. So you definitely need those offensive rebounds. So yeah, I think we gotta we gotta wait and see. I'm hoping that LeBron is back sooner rather than later because I at least want him to be back for those last two regular season games just to kind of get the tune up in, and then he can jump into the playoffs. And I think from there he's pretty much gonna gonna do what he does once he gets the ball gets rolling and he starts to heat up. I think we're going to see regular LeBron and they get through that first round of the playoffs. Then 
the I think the engine will be will be revved up enough. Whoever they play in the second round, I think they can go from there. They can go on to the back to the NBA finals. And whoever they see during that run, you know, it's up to them. Um, on the Eastern side, though, on, on the Eastern Conference, Brooklyn been struggling a little bit as, as of late, um, which is, I don't know, man, it's, it's, it's not looking good because they've been losing to, to top teams and bottom teams during this uh, this last stretch of games. The two back-to-back losses to Milwaukee were tough because that's a team that you're possibly going to see um, in the second round of the playoffs. So you don't want to give them extra confidence going into a second round playoff ma- uh, matchup, especially when Giannis and the Bucks have maybe the most to prove just because one, they're trying to keep Giannis and two, they've been the number one seed, obviously outside of this year, but the past couple of years and, and haven't been able to get past the second round. So they have a lot to prove themselves. Um, but then the other thing is, how important James Harden is to this team. I think they were like uh, was it seven and eight without James Harden playing this season. That's not good because James Harden was the addition to this team. This was supposed to be a title contending team without James Harden on it. When it was just Kyrie uh, and, and, and KD before LeVert and Jared Allen and those boys left for, for James Harden. Now James Harden comes in and He's playing like an MVP candidate, and you can tell because they were dominating, but now Harden is out, and it's down to just KD and Kyrie, and they're looking real shaky, and they're looking shaky at the worst possible time. Like, you don't want to start getting beat up going into the playoffs, especially when you had a chance to be the number one seed throughout, and you blew that because you dropped the ball, uh, you know, pretty much. So, you know, what, what do you think, though, Eric? I agree. Uh, Harden was supposed to be the guy who made this a sure thing for them. They were supposed to already be title contenders without Harden. So I'm a little worried about them, but I'm worried about them for the same reason that I was worried about them before the start of the season. How how were they going to click chemistry wise? How were they going to come together and be able to figure it out for the first time? Because again, Kyrie and KD had never played together this year, and now they've had limited opportunities to play together because of injuries. They still got to figure out a way to integrate Harden into all that because I believe their big three has only played about eight games in total together. So yeah. they've, they've got some question marks and I think their issues against Milwaukee highlighted that. Um, they also got question marks on defense. They're still not a very good defensive team. And that's going to, that could be the biggest, uh, biggest issue in the playoffs for them. If they can't consistently get stops, if they can't consistently make plays on a defensive end, it ain't going to matter how much star power you got on the other side, because when you're giving up 120 points a game, that means you in a shootout every night. So, yeah, you know, I, I think they got some they got some things they got to figure out. James Harden has told us that he's going to be back before the playoffs, but yet there has been no date on that. And again, this is it. This is the last week of the season. So yeah. unless he's un, unless he's going to play all week, I, I don't know where he's getting these reps in with these guys. They, they've they got a lot of question marks, man. Um, that's not to say that I wouldn't expect them to win the first round series. That's not to say I still wouldn't put money on them to come out of the East. Again, they got the most star power. So we got to believe they're the best team in the East. But I don't think it's a clear cut uh, runaway um, team in the East. I think every I think those three teams in the East are pretty much neck and neck. And it's pretty much a matter of who can get the easier path to the finals. You know, if, if we can avoid playing Milwaukee in the second round and maybe playing somebody else in the second round, that makes it easier for us. But right now, Brooklyn's got some issues. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Harden shouldn't be the chemistry because that's what it's looking like. He's the glue, like, especially because you guys came together last year. So it wasn't even, you know what I mean? Like, this is not supposed to be James Harden's thing. He should not be the chemistry that clicks everything together and has you guys looking like a championship team. He's just supposed to be, oh, yeah, and we got James Harden. That's how that's supposed to be. Not like, yo, we need James Harden on the court because we can't win without him. So, Listen, I hope they get it together. I do want to see Lakers Nets in the finals. You know what I'm saying? Like, this, that's just me being the selfish fan. I want to see LeBron versus KD going at it in the final. Plus, then you got Brooklyn up there, which I, I would love as well. But they got to get it. They got to get the act together. Um, before we leave, Brooklyn native Carmelo Anthony, uh, who did want to play for the Knicks, though, but he's still from Brooklyn. So it's all good. We can still claim him. Uh, he is now officially top 10 
on the all-time scoring list. Um, please put some respect on Carmelo Anthony's name because a lot of people did not even feel like Carmelo Anthony could play in this league anymore. Um, and he's disproved that myth. And now he is officially in the top 10 all-time scoring club. Um, if you didn't feel like he was a, a Hall of Famer already before joining the, the top 10 all-time list, he's probably going to move up a little bit more because I don't think he's retiring this year. I think he's going to still continue to play at least for another year after this one because he, he's playing well. So why would he, you know what I'm saying, why would he retire? Obviously, he's not mellow from eight years ago, but he's still playing well in that role um, that he's in coming up the bench for Portland. And again, he's in the top 10 now all-time scoring. So if you didn't have him before in the Hall of Fame, this should, you know, put him in, in, the, in the Hall of Fame for you, unless you're just a hater. Uh, he, he was already Hall of Fame. I agree with you on that. He was Hall. Uh, I'm glad that he found a great landing spot in Portland. Like you said, he's coming off the bench, so he's accepted that role. But more importantly, they still run offense for him because he is one of the most skilled offensive players the game has ever seen. Uh, obviously, being top 10 in points solidifies that. But Melo's first ballot Hall of Fame. And I think I think Melo probably got two years left in him just because of the way he I can shoot too. the ball. You know, he... he and, and in this league now that continues to get smaller and smaller in terms of position, he could be a stretch for, you know, again, for two more years and just pick and pop. He'll pick and pop you to death for 12 to 15 points a night. So, yeah. Melo, shout out to him, man. He's definitely first ballot, man. Absolutely. And uh, before we before we get out of basketball, uh, Zion is done. Uh, the thumb uh, sucks. Um, but uh, if he was going to get injured, at least it was, I would say I would prefer it be a thumb or something like that as opposed to something in the knees or the legs or something like that that I feel like would take him out of basketball long term. Um, you know, with this, I think obviously, you know, he's going to be out for the season, but we only got about a week left of the season anyway. So it's not like he's missing that much. And I doubt they were going to do anything to, to, to sneak into the playoffs at this point. So, but uh, definitely just wish him a speedy recovery. Um, and hopefully next year he'll come back and maybe they can make a push for the playoffs next season. Um, Joe Saunders got his ass whooped uh, this week. Billy Joe? Billy Joe what? got his ass whooped. But um, shout out to Canelo <laughs> for the win and unifying the belts. But um, this the eye injury that he suffered, he may miss some time. And a lot of time, when I say sometime, but they, they, they're talking about the severity of the eye injury that he suffered in the fight and if he's, you know, going to be able to come back. Listen, Billy Joe put a, a valiant effort forward. I'm, I'm not going to discredit that. Um, but he's not the caliber of Canelo Alvarez. And for, for people who thought, oh, he's lefty, that's going to mean something, it didn't mean nothing but you getting your eye socket broke. Um, you UK fighters as well, Y'all gonna learn to stop coming to the States and talking shit because he came over here. He, nah, y'all gonna learn. Part, part of my language, I know we're a family show, but y'all gonna <laughs> learn, bro, because y'all come over here and y'all be, be talking real crazy. And then it seems like y'all always getting knocked out. Like Anthony Joshua came to the States, got knocked out. Remember when Ricky Hatton came to the States and then got knocked Jeez. into the ring post? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Remember when Amir Khan almost, almost passed away <laughs> in the ring? You know what I'm saying? Like y'all gonna Mr. learn Glass to Joe? stop. Yeah. Amir Khan, we didn't we didn't see several American fighters almost send you to the pearly gates. So y'all gotta relax, bro. Y'all gotta relax. It's a, but on on the topic of this, Canelo Alvarez is clearly the pound for pound best fighter in the world. Please, people, stop. Respect the man's game. Respect his craft. You know the dude keeps taking on bigger and bigger challenges. This is a guy who started as a welterweight, and here he is fighting at 168, fighting at light heavyweight, and still knocking out guys that are supposed to be bigger and stronger than him. Canelo Alvarez, kudos to him, man. He's the best. I hope he unifies the division against Caleb Plant, which they've already uh, speculated could be in the works. But more importantly, man, I, I want to see maybe next year, not this year, but maybe next year, I would love to see him and Errol Spence at a catch weight get it on, man. Mm, that, might be, that might be interesting. I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind seeing that. Um, it might I, be I would tough love to, to see. Happen. I love both those fighters, by the way. Canelo was actually even talking about another Triple G fight. Um, I wouldn't even mind seeing that one. I just, you know, I just want some good fights because yeah. we see the the foolery that's going on right now in the heavyweight division. So when we thought it was coming back, and you 
I'm just gonna blame it on COVID because y'all just dropped the ball on every all the momentum the heavyweight division had before COVID. Y'all dropped the ball. Everybody's scared to fight everybody. Nobody wants to jump in the ring. You know, it's it, I'm over it already. Um, and this is why people like myself and a lot of people around the world are getting more excited for these exhibition fights than these regular fights because we can't get the fights we want to see. Um, I will say this. I'm looking forward to the to the Mayweather, Logan, uh, Paul fight, but I, I need to, to speak to, I need to have a serious moment with Jake Paul because I need for him to understand the severity of what he did the other day by snatching Floyd Mayweather's hat off his head. Now, I understand he's not from our culture, and he did, he wasn't raised this way, so I'm going to give him a, a pass on that. But from this moment forward, I need you to understand that there are certain things as a culture that we do not play around with, and it will be the cause of a severe ass whooping that will come to you, okay? It's, we don't play those little snatch the, my hat off and run games. We take that stuff very serious. I understand. He doesn't understand that because he's not of this culture. Something a lot worse could have happened to you, okay, if there were not thousands of cameras and social media and all of that stuff around. That is not something that you want to do. We don't tolerate things like that. It's not a game for us. It is not a joke for us. And you can get your ass seriously handed to you for doing things like that. So I just want to let you know, you you kind of realize the severity of it, but you still are kind of toying with it and, 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 and you know, doing extra things, trying to, trying to stir up a fight for you and Mayweather after. But this this ain't the way you want to go, bro. Yeah, he, he got yoked up, and he, he's lucky it wasn't worse than that. Um, I thought, honestly, they, they might even angle to let Floyd fight them both in the same night. But uh, apparently Al Heyman has come out and said that I, I don't even think they're going to allow Jake Paul in the building that night of the fight. Um, I don't know if there were some other things that went on. I, I heard he was, uh, again, it's a family show, so I heard he was being a real donkey during the press conference. Um, even leading up to that moment. So I think that's why Al Heyman kind of feels like, yo, bro, you, you, you causing a little too much issues here. And we just trying to get a, get an event done and get a fight done and get everybody get paid. So, um, you know, he'll learn, he's a young dude, man. He, he's stirring up a little something for the fight and maybe that'll draw in some more viewers that want to watch it. But if y'all thought what Canelo did to Billy Joe Saunders was bad, just watch for the three or four rounds that Floyd toys with, with Logan Paul, cause it ain't going to go more than four rounds. No. And and, that, and that's what I thought. When when I saw that happen, first of all, I was just like completely disgusted by the whole thing. Just because, again, I understand there's certain things we don't accept in this culture. And that's a level of disrespect that we don't tolerate. So I understand that thing could have been worse. Like, if if you remember, you remember back in, 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 in like the 90s and the you know early 2000s, there was like a big thing where people would talk about the, the whole idea of stepping on somebody's Jordans. And what could come from just stepping on somebody's Jordans? So you take that. This is like the the, the level of, of of disrespect. Like we don't tolerate. Like I don't know how you play around and your culture and with your friends, but there's there's levels of, of of disrespect um that we just don't tolerate. We're not going to. We're not going to change as a culture anytime. So like I just don't see that happening. Where we from? We don't play those type of games. And you thinking it's a joke? The only thing that you just did was you just really got your brother hurt. Because Mayweather is, is going to beat your brother badly in that ring. And he's not going to hold back. He's not going to carry the fight. He's going to punish your brother. And then he's going to punish you right after that. We'll have a many months down the road, maybe it'll be October, something like that. After he beats the brakes off of Logan Paul, he is going to sign and make another hundred, two hundred million dollars to come back and beat the brakes off of you, and then nobody is going to want to see you get back in that ring after that. Pretty much, that's how it's going to go. And this is what you call us for doing the the, the Tom Foolery. You could have got a fight with maybe gotcha without hat. doing that. You're like, what are you gotcha like? Hat. What? <laughs> could gotcha you, hat. bro? Could you? I imagine? hope it was worth it. Yeah, I, I, really, I hope it was. I hope, I hope for your brother's sake. You doing that was worth it because he's going to be the one that's got to feel it right away. The immediate ramifications of, of your actions, your brother is going to have to deal with on June 6th when he steps into the ring with arguably the, the, the greatest fighter to ever do this thing. The, 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 the man that holds the record, that, that, that 50, was 51 and 0 right now, he's going to have to get in the ring with that man. 
couldn't be me. <laughs> Wouldn't be me. Um, but I will say this: while we're on boxing, the state of Florida, they will not be testing for marijuana anymore. Um, I mean, I guess I could, you know, you could sort of see this thing coming. The more and more we see marijuana getting legalized throughout the country for recreational purposes, um, you know, eventually they're going to start changing those stances on. Anyway, Florida is just, you know, opening the gate and starting this thing off. So for anybody that's fly, fighting in Florida, you know, if you want to want to roll up your spliff and get your 420 on, you still good. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I mean, we knew it was a matter of time. I don't think it has any effect on boxers training, right? Like, no, I don't, I don't think it affects really, you in any way if you're training, so. No, it's not like, it's not, yeah, it's not, it's not like a performance enhancing drug. It might actually help you right, feel a little bit better though, like, you know, because just the mental yeah. and the physical the CBD, the oils and stuff like that. So from that standpoint, but it's not something that enhances anything in the, in the ring. Yeah. That, I mean, not only that, like it doesn't help you cut weight or anything. So yeah, I don't, it doesn't really have much of an impact, like I said, other than to, to help your body recuperate faster. Um, so, you know, kudos to the state. And it's only a matter of time before every state starts adapting the same mindset. Exactly. Um, shout out to, uh, to, to DK Metcalf, uh, finished ninth in the uh the trials but that boy fast uh, you know what i'm saying congratulations i know he didn't he didn't win he didn't he didn't uh qualify or whatever but you know the fact that he was up there and finished ninth he didn't finish last he finished in, in ninth place and you could tell like just as far as like physical st- structure he's the biggest guy there um and he's not trained as a as a track as a track runner so you know certain things that you know if you if you run track that you know certain things with your body and form and stuff like that that you know takes time not for somebody to really just get into this because it's not like he ran track in high school or anything like that and he's just getting back into it he's pretty much just going from i'm mad fast and i want to do this i'm gonna try it and, and that's what he did yeah shout out to him i mean we we knew he was fast as hell when he chased down buddha baker on that uh on that prime top game so yes you know what I'm saying? we we know he, he's super fast but i always applaud the guys who, who do something productive in their off season right we get on the guys who make bad decisions in their off season there's another way for him to stay in shape during the off season you know what i'm saying he's training with the track team so kudos to him man and hey we, we gotta applaud guys who want to chase their dreams and, and chase some of the other things that they think about as, as young men so kudos to him absolutely uh really quick final thought before we get up out of here Final thought, uh, it's going to be a great last week of the season, man. I'm so looking forward to how this season plays out, mainly because my Knicks are in the playoffs. And again, I don't have to keep saying if the season start, if the playoffs started today, we're in great shape right now. Um, the NFL schedule comes out Wednesday, so I'm sure that's going to give us more to talk about next week as well, man. So everybody just stay healthy. It's starting to warm up out there. We know our city is about to open back up. Just stay healthy out there, and we appreciate the love and support. That's a fact. Uh, I'm just going to just uh, shout out Cortez. He's in that uh, Ultimate Madness tournament with the uh, URL TV for 100,000. He just won again. So congrats uh, to Cortez on that one. Wishing you luck throughout the rest of this tournament. Um, let me just shout out the sponsors really quick, though. Uh, Petro Home Services, Kmart, the Rosado Firm, Soundview Liquors. And uh, make sure you guys are subscribed to the Real Fans Real Talk and the Sanchez uh, Show podcast on all major streaming platforms. If you guys are in New York City, you know you can watch every Thursday, 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. on Verizon 43, BPN2. If you are not, don't worry. All you got to do is go on the website, realfansrealtalk.com, and um, you can watch live right there with everybody else anywhere in the world at 8 o'clock. Um, Facebook dot com forward slash real fans real talk twitter instagram at real fan talk and of course subscribe to the youtube channel youtube.com forward slash for the fans productions and while you're subscribing make sure you you uh you subscribe to the shooting the shit podcast as well because that's where you know we, we put the put the kids to bed to bed on and we get to work on the shooting the shit podcast so if you want to be grown with us <laughs> subscribe to the shooting the shit podcast But uh, with that being said, for myself, Trip Young, my brother, my co-host, Legend in Two Games, Eric Sanchez, we up out of here. Peace. Peace. Uh huh. This is real fans, real talk, talk, real fans.
fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we at least. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9 For the older folks, so even if you younger No matter what sport, this show, we got it covered It's filmed live in the middle of BK So ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays What's up guys, I'm Emerald Marie and be sure to check us out on the web at realfansrealtalk.com.